and welcome to the Sustaining Soils podcast brought to you by Valent Biosciences. I'm your host, Lisa Peterson. We are excited you have joined us today for our first podcast in this series. We will explore a popular topic today in agriculture that has frankly become a bit of a buzzword, soil health. In today's podcast, we will start with the basics of soil health and then dive into the practical aspects of it as well. We have two experts in the field joining us who will also help us move past the basics and into a deeper understanding of how it affects you and me as a farmer and ultimately our bottom line. So to begin with, I'd like to welcome our first guest, Nick Gazer. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Lisa. Happy to be here. Glad to have you with us. And for those that are listening a little bit about Nick, he is the founder and president of Craig's on Innovation Group. He has a PhD and has conducted extensive research experience in the areas of crop production, nutrient cycling and management, and environmental quality. He has served as CEO for the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Nick launched and led the Soil Health Partnership and has held VP roles for the National Corn Growers Association and U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. And our second guest that I'd like to introduce to you today is Charles Cowden. Welcome, Charles. Hi, Lisa. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Charles earned his PhD in plant biology, focusing on the ecology and evolution of plant microbe symbioses. He continued to explore mycorrhizal symbioses as a postdoctoral researcher, but then transitioned to agricultural research with the USDA. After several years with the USDA, Charles moved to private industry as a part of the Microbial Discovery Group with Monsanto. In his three years with Valent Biosciences, he has been a senior scientist in the Rhizosphere Research Group, the manager for Rhizosphere Product Development, and leads the Long-Term Soil Health Program. As you can hear, we have some wonderful guests with us today, and so let's go ahead and get started. So Nick, I'm going to start with you. Let's get us all on the same page and start with those basics. What is the definition of soil health? Lisa, I think there are a lot of ways to define soil health, but I like to point to the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And their definition of soil health is it's defined as a continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So now we have that base definition. How is soil health measured? Charles? So soil health has a number of metrics, and they fall into three broad categories. The first one is the chemical aspects of soil health, and I think a lot of us are familiar with that. These are your macronutrients, your NPK, uh, your micronutrient availability, your pH, your cation exchange capacity, things you get from a normal soils test. The second big group is the physical characteristics, and so these are aggregate stability tests and water infiltration rates. The third set are the biological indicators. And these indicators are a little bit new to the game. They've been in the academic and the research uh, realm for a long time, but now they're starting to come to the forefront of the soil health conversation. Some of the indicators that you might be familiar with are soil respiration, uh, you know, active carbon, soil organic matter, and the activity of different enzymes. Fundamentally, these are all processes that uh, interact directly with the living soil and the microbiome. Charles, so you mentioned the soil microbiome. Let's take a minute to define what that is. That's a great point, Lisa. The soil microbiome is the suite of bacteria and fungi that interact in the soil. So it's a community of microorganisms that make up the microbiome. So Nick, we've talked about these three soil indicators, the physical, the chemical, and the biological. How does the soil microbiome promote the balance between those three? The soil microbiome can help in, in creating a balance of those by mediating some of the um, some of the efficiencies we're looking for as a farmer. So uh, with bacteria and fungi uh, making nutrients more readily available or extending the surface area of the roots or the ability for the roots to, to tap into water resources in the soil, especially under the short-term droughts or, or help with um, the flow of water infiltration into the soil in, in the short-term uh, floods that we have as well. So let's take this one level deeper to this practical level. I'm a third generation corn and soybean farmer. Obviously, as farmers, we have many, many decisions each year to make in regards to our operation. And most of those decisions are intertwined. So how do I take what we just learned here about the soil health indicators and the soil microbiome? And how do I incorporate that into my operation? 
I, I think to incorporate, really incorporate it into your operation is starting from the knowledge that you've probably already started. You've probably already done something. You've probably made some changes over the years, whether it's with your planting equipment, your, your tillage equipment, maybe moving to a less intensive form of tillage, even from like a deep uh, disc ripper to a vertical till tool or to no-till soybean, something like that. You've probably made changes this way. Similarly, with nutrient use efficiency, over time, I'm not aware of many farmers that haven't made changes to nutrient use efficiency, always working to get better. All of those components feed into enhancing soil health and feed into enhancing the microbiome. While I say that, there are always opportunities. Again, every single farm I've been on has always had opportunities for improvement. So then it's looking to ask what could be taken to the next level. And that's where it's looking across what you're doing, the different decisions you're making throughout the growing season, and really trying to keep soil health on the forefront of your mind and asking questions about how each decision, whether it's a crop protection product or a marketing decision or a labor management decision, how each one of those could affect the soil microbiome and your soil health indicators. Nick, it sounds like you know a lot of those things that we're already doing obviously impact our soil health. And it's good to hear that we're making those steps. But as we continue to progress in our operation and making more of those steps, maybe going from no-till, you know, to maybe no-till soybeans and, and changing some of, you know, from that deeper tillage to vertical tillage, what would be the next logical step if we've already made some of those changes in our operation? A, a next step could be looking to cover crops. Cover crops come in a lot of different forms and sizes. A lot of farmers have, have started trialing cover crops. And, and looking to cover crops, I would be asking, how can I start small? How can I start small? How can I surround myself with the right people who have knowledge about which cover crops to plant and when, how to make plans for managing those cover crops, especially in the spring, and say if you're ahead of a corn crop, if you're trying to manage a cereal rye or a clover or something like that, how do you manage that to make sure your corn crop, that cash crop gets in and you, you, you optimize the, the yield coming out of that, your income coming out of that corn crop. So um, cover crops can be a great stop, but don't go into it all at once. Start small, have the team around you, have plan A, B, and C all ready to go and, and take, it, take it from there. Definitely start small is a great way to start. And Charles, help us understand why cover crops are beneficial to the soil and the soil microbiome. You know, cover crops can be a very important part of your journey to a healthier soil. I like to, to think of a healthy soil as a living soil. Fundamentally, if your soil is dead, it is not a healthy soil. And for a soil, particularly the microbiome, to, to be active, it needs a food source. And so, you know, cover cropping, you know, the live root in the soil year round, that's feeding the microbes. But, you know, you can take a step back. Leaving plant residue in the field is also providing food for these microbes. And so anything you can do and anything you can incorporate onto your farm practices that provides energy for these microbes is going to really invigorate the microbiome. And of course, this microbiome, again, it affects all facets of soil health. It is sort of at the nexus of the biological, the chemical, and physical aspects of soil health. It's critical to maintain an active microbiome. And anything you can do to feed that microbiome be it a living root, be it plant residue, or even you know, carbon sources that may just reinvigorate the microbiome at the beginning of a growing season when you plant. Those are all things that are gonna help you make those first steps towards building a healthy soil. So what options do I have if I can't do cover crops or I haven't figured out how to do that management yet? You could look to other things beyond cover crops. I mentioned earlier, I think uh, we were talking about the, the chemical components of the soil, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium, your micronutrients. Maybe look there. Look there and see if there are opportunities to enhance your nutrient use efficiency program. Um, look to incorporating our muscular mycorrhizae into that program to help extend and improve your nutrient use efficiency. Uh, you could look even beyond that to your, your water management, your water management in the soils, if you're irrigating, what does that look like? Or if you're not irrigating, how can you improve that water holding capacity of your soil through, just say, conservation tillage? So Charles, are there any products that I'm able to use to inoculate my soil? Yes, there are a number of bacterial products in the marketplace. However, we at Valen Biosciences look to mycorrhizal fungi as a keystone component of the soil microbiome. And we have a suite of products where you can apply and enhance mycorrhizae 
Uh, EndoFuse is a seed applied product. And we're really excited about our EndoPrime SC product, which is a liquid inferro applied consortium of four strains of mycorrhizal fungi. So let's talk about mycorrhizal fungi just a little bit more. Tell me what role does it play in the soil microbiome and soil health? Oh, yeah, Lisa, I love talking about mycorrhizal fungi. I think a lot of us have been exposed to bacterial products uh, in the marketplace, but mycorrhizal fungi are fundamentally different. Bacteria can be applied as a seed coating, or it can be sprayed on, you know, as a foliar application or a soil application. Mycorrhizae are different. They need to be in the soil, and they act differently with the plant. You know, a bacteria can form an association, but usually it has a very small area where it's going to have an effect, maybe just right on the surface of the root or right around where you plant the seed. Mycorrhizae grow with the plant root. It's a association between a fungus directly with the plant root. And this is an exchange of resources. The plant provides carbon in the form of sugars and some lipids to feed the fungus. And the fungus, you know, provides nutrients, water, and extends the rooting zone of the plant to explore smaller pockets of soil, deeper pockets of soil, you know, far away from the plant and obtain nutrients, and water and basically help plants survive drought stress, nutrient stress, and in general, you'll have a healthier plant. Charles, you're making some great points. And I think about it from the farmer's perspective, um, a lot of what you're talking about can help mitigate the micro droughts that farmers might not be tracking. And up to 25% of yield losses occur year over year within Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Nebraska, within the heart of the Corn Belt due to these micro droughts, which are three to four day events, just long enough for that crop not to have enough water for grain fill or pollination. And this could help mitigate those, those micro drought events. Charles and Nikki both made just excellent points around that. And I find it really fascinating as we talk more about mycorrhizal fungi and the effects that it has on extending that root zone for those plants. Is there any other items that I need to be thinking about long-term for better soil health? I think um, it's really great to be thinking about different time frames, and especially the long term. Uh, I, I think for a farmer, it's thinking about the the, the co benefits as well. You might be watching directly your nutrient use efficiency, but also asking what are the other uh, what are the other benefits that could be coming along with these changes. Things like uh, improving weed weed management. If you're planting a cover crop, if you're enhancing nutrient use efficiency, so you have a, a better actively growing main crop. You're going to more actively compete against those weeds, especially those tough ones like Palmer or others that you're, that you're fighting right now. And that a lot of the changes can take um, several years to, to accrue. You might not see all of the changes at the same time. They might, there are, there are short-term ones like the weed management. There are nutrient changes that could happen over two to five years. And then the physical changes that might happen over a five to 10 year time frame. So yeah, it, it's, it's good to be thinking about what you might see in lab. Thanks, Nick. What, how about you, Charles? Soil health is always a long-term uh, proposition. And it's a journey, and you take the first steps of the journey probably by doing your favorite thing in the day, and that's walking your field. And then talking to your friends and your fellow farmers about how they approach soil health. Get your hands in the dirt, and you know, you know what healthy soil feels like, and, and you probably have a really good idea of what unhealthy soil feels like. And so you need to be thinking about, you know, getting back in touch literally with your field. And so if you can spend time on your field and you can spend time, uh, you know, discussing these aspects of soil health with your, your fellow farmers, that's probably the most important aspects of, of, of getting started on the soil health journey. As we wrap up today, what is one key takeaway you want growers or farmers to know and understand about soil health. Nick? Start small. Start small and give it a fair shot. Talk to those around you, like what Charles was saying earlier. Build your data collection system. What are you going to track over time? And which decisions are going to impact or be impacted by your soil health changes? Um, I think that's that's probably the, the best place to start and that it doesn't happen overnight. Stick with it. Try again. Again, plan A might work, might not. You might have labor move off the farm. You might have a machinery breakdown. You might have a weather event. You got to plan for that and plan that into your soil health journey for whatever you're doing. 
all of those things have definitely happened on the farm. So I love how you said, you know, to start small and to have plan A, B, and C, because we cannot control all the factors in our environment as farmers and growers. Charles, what would you say is one key takeaway? Uh, the key takeaway I have about soil health is that you're not alone on the journey. Soil health can seem like a, you know, a daunting task, very ambiguous, but there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, you can explore the USDA and RCS website. I'm sure you have a great relationship with your uh, county extension agent. As we wrap up today, what do you see in soil health for the future? Nick? I see some changes in terminology. I see some market changes. The terminology, we're, we're probably, many of us are probably hearing about regenerative agriculture. Underpinning that is soil health. We're probably all wondering and looking at and just having a lot of confusion around what's happening in the carbon markets. That too is underpinned by soil health. So watch the terminology and, and just, I guess, know that soil health underpins a lot of these, these changes in terminology, a lot of the, the buzzwords that are coming out. In addition to that, watch the market forces, the carbon markets. I mean, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of hype on these carbon markets. You don't have to jump into this. You can, again, start small. And there are going to be a lot of changes probably in the next 6 to 18 months. Uh, so just like we were talking about with the soil health journey, start small. Maybe it's 10 acres, maybe it's 40 acres. Don't feel you need to enroll your entire farm into any carbon program today. Take your time. I think that's a great point, Nick, of recognizing that you can start small, you can continue to research and see where this market's going to play out because it, it definitely is changing. And I think we'll continue to see some changes over the next six to 12 months. Charles, where do you see soil health in the future? We're going to develop tools to help you better understand soil health that's regionally important and important on your farm. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us today and listening to our conversation about soil health with Nick Gazer and Charles Cowden. This has been the Sustaining Soils podcast brought to you by Valent Biosciences. We look forward to you joining us for our next podcast, where we will dig into the science behind plant health versus soil health. And don't forget to find us on Twitter at Valent Biosci, LinkedIn and YouTube at Valent Biosciences, and on our website at valentbiosciences.com.